This is Ben Kester, orthopedic surgery resident at NYU Langone Orthopedic Hospital, presenting Dr. Jezrawi's technique for fifth metatarsal intramedullary screw fixation. Here are our disclosures. Fractures of the fifth metatarsal are among the most common fractures of the foot. They were initially described by Sir Robert Jones in 1902 after he sustained the injury himself while dancing. Management of Jones fractures, typically used to describe those within the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction, is uniquely controversial due to the high occurrence of non-union at this site. The proximal fifth metatarsal articulates with the cuboid bone proximally and the base of the fourth metatarsal medially. The plantar fascia attaches to the plantar lateral aspect of the tuberosity, while the peroneus brevis and peroneus tertius attach to the dorsal surface of the tuberosity and metaphysis, respectively. The most common injury mechanism involves an indirect force secondary to foot plantar flexion and inversion. The metaphyseal diaphyseal junction is at risk for non-union as it represents a watershed region between blood supplies the proximal metaphyseal arteries via the peroneus brevis and the distal nutrient arteries of the diaphysis. The peroneus brevis tendon may contribute to the development of the Jones fracture, creating deforming forces resulting in fracture instability. Fifth metatarsal fractures have been classified based on the location of injury. This includes the tuberosity, zone 1, metaphyseal diaphyseal junction, zone 2, or proximal diaphysis, zone 3. It is important to identify the correct zone of injury because healing characteristics and suggested treatments depend on the zone of injury. Our patient is a 23-year-old male collegiate basketball player, Division I, with pain and swelling on the lateral aspect of his forefoot. He sustained the injury during practice one day prior. Physical exam demonstrates tenderness over the base of the fifth metatarsal. He has no ankle tenderness and the rest of his examination is normal. X-rays confirm a Jones fracture in zone 2. This patient was indicated for operative fixation as he was a Division I basketball player. Most patients can be treated conservatively with casting alone. Although the reported non-union rate can be as high as 25%, 95% typically achieve union. However, the primary disadvantage to conservative management is delayed union and increased time until return to sport. The literature supports a period of non-weight bearing in a short leg cast for six to eight weeks for most patients, and early surgical fixation in athletic patients. Intramedullary screw fixation is the standard of care, and bone grafting may be used in cases of non-union. Although techniques such as tension band wiring and percutaneous lag screws have been described, partially threaded intramedullary screw fixation remains the gold standard. Typically, the canal is reamed to allow the largest screw diameter and a tight endosteal fit. The literature supports that a minimum screw size of 4.5 millimeters is necessary for adequate purchase. In cases of delayed union or non-union, cancellous autograft or allograft may be used. Multiple studies in the literature suggest a union rate as high as 100% following operative treatment of Jones fractures can be expected in athletes. If the intramedullary screw is left in place, refracture is rare. Patients also return to sport quickly after a mean of 7.5 weeks following surgical fixation. The four most common complications following surgery to repair the proximal fifth metatarsal are delayed union or non-union, refracture, prominent screw head, and sural nerve injury. Delayed union or non-union may be associated with screw placement less than 4.5 millimeters in diameter or too early return to sport. Refracture may be associated with early screw removal and it's suggested that it remain in place until the end of patient's athletic careers. In short, this case can be performed on an ambulatory surgery basis using regional anesthesia. An incision is made at the base of the fifth metatarsal, a guide wire is inserted under fluoroscopy over which a cannulated drill and finally a screw are inserted. The patient is placed supine with a C-arm adjacent to the operating room table. The base of the fifth metatarsal is palpated to determine the appropriate starting point. Image intensification to confirm where the incision should be placed is performed with a freer elevator. Prior to incision, a small percutaneous stab incision is placed to find the appropriate location, through which the guide wire is advanced. Both the AP and lateral views are used to confirm the correct high and inside position for insertion of the guide wire.
After this is confirmed, we dissect down and use the soft tissue protector to protect both the perineus brevis as well as the sural nerve. Lateral imaging confirms appropriate placement and reaming over the guide wire is performed with sleeve protection. Again, imaging intensification confirms the appropriate position. The tap is used to determine the correctly sized screw. We wait for appropriate chatter. The screw length is measured off of the K-wire. However, we also place a screw adjacent to the fifth metatarsal under image intensification to make sure it is not too long. A 55mm, 5.5mm partially threaded, non-cannulated screw is inserted as can be seen here, reducing the fracture. AP and lateral imaging confirms excellent position of the screw. The wound is then closed with nylon interrupted sutures. Post-op rehabilitation includes crutches and non-weight bearing for the first two weeks. The patient is made weight bearing as tolerated in a removable walking boot during weeks two through six and advanced to weight bearing as tolerated without a boot at week six. Then gradual return to sporting activity at weeks seven and eight. X-ray taken at eight weeks confirm healing of the base of the fifth metatarsal fracture. This has been a presentation on fifth metatarsal Jones fractures intramedullary screw fixation. Thank you for watching.